Hello and welcome to our presentation of Heart Nut Disease. My name is Rebecca Fiesler and my partner Haley Dull will be joining us later on in this presentation. Here's our table of contents slide just giving you a brief overview of what our presentation is going to look like. Section 1 is our case study including an overview, physical exam and workup, treatment and conclusion to it. Section 2 is our disease overview section, including a history and epidemiology of heart and up disease. Section 3 is our biochemical perspective section, and this includes amino acid absorption and its importance, key metabolite overviews, including melatonin, serotonin, and niacin, and an overview of the mutation of the SLC6A19 gene and how that causes signs and symptoms of heart and up disease. Lastly, section four is heart and up disease progression, including signs and symptoms, diagnosis, current treatment, pro prognosis, and future research needed. Over the course of this presentation, we will be reviewing heart and up disease in the context of a case study. This case report is from Biomed Central Pediatrics and was published in 2014. It is entitled Severe Persistent Unremitting Dermatitis, Chronic Diarrhea and Hypoalbuninemia in a Child, Heart Nips Disease. We're going to start off with a case study overview. To the left, you'll see our patient upon initial presentation. It is a three-year-old Palestinian female with persistent chronic diarrhea and hypoalbuminia since age one. Her initial presentation was a significant photosensitivity, scaly rash to face and neck, or also known as pellagra, upper and lower extremities, low energy, and oral ulcers. She was first admitted for severe chronic malnutrition. Upon initial presentation, the physicians did a physical exam and laboratory findings on our patient. Her physical exam findings were that she had abnormally low growth parameters, so she was well below the average growth curve for three-year-olds. She had generalized pitting edema, and she had mild abdominal distension, but without organomegaly. As far as her laboratory findings go, she had anemia and coagulation abnormalities in her blood. She had a night niacin deficiency, and she had increased neutral amino acids with tryptophan being the majority. So after this comprehensive workup, our patient was diagnosed with heart and up disease caused by a niacin deficiency, so she was treated with niacin 50 milligrams three times a day. She was also prescribed a gluten-free and protein-rich diet in order to try to get her weight gain up. And as you can see, the photo on the right is our patient post-treatment and she looks way healthier. As I was saying earlier, our patient was diagnosed with heart and up disease and it was caused by a niacin deficiency. It, uh, this diagnosis was based on the initial presentation of pellagra, which was the rash all over her body, the distribution of that rash, and the photosensitivity. Ultimately, it was an abnormality that they found in her analysis of amino acids of tryptophan transport that led to this deficiency, and it was confirmed through a urine amino acid chromatography, which showed neutral amino aciduria with, as I was saying, tryptophan being the main amino acid. They started the patient on oral niacin, and she had complete symptom resolution within four weeks of the diagnosis. As we head into the bulk of our presentation, I wanted to start off with a brief history of heart and heart disease. In 1956, Barron et al. described this strange disorder by observing the heart and family in London. He noticed photosensitivity, pellagra, and there was no known cause of this. And so he diagnosed it as heart nup disease. In 2001, Nozaki et al. localized the gene responsible for these symptoms for heart nup disease to chromosome 5p15.33, which is the chromosome on your right. And in 2004, two groups cloned the gene that causes heart nup disease from their specific region of the chromosome. 
in this they found several mutations. At the time it was 17, now they have determined that up to 23 mutations cause heart and heart disease. And ultimately in 2004, the SLC6A19 gene was identified as the disease causing gene. Heart and heart disease ranks among the most common amino acid disorders worldwide. As far as frequency goes, in the United States it affects 1 in 30,000 individuals and it, it's about the same worldwide as you can see in New South Wales. It affects 1 in 23,000 and in Quebec it affects 1 in 54. There is no race or sexual preference. It typically presents in young children ranging from 3 to 9 years of age and it is an autosomal recessive trait. As I was saying earlier, heart and heart disease is an autosomal recessive trait. As you can see in our PICTO diagram on the right, there is an unaffected carrier father, an unaffected carrier mother, and one of their four children is a recessive homozygote. So that means the child will have heart and heart disease and all of its associated signs and symptoms. Moving on to our biochemical perspective slide. Heart and heart disease is an autosomal recessive defect of the SLC6A19 gene, which encodes for specific neutral amino acid transporters. This defect causes intestinal and renal malabsorption of neutral amino acids such as phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Heart and heart symptoms are mainly due to a tryptophan malabsorption. As we know, tryptophan is metabolized to form serotonin, melatonin, and niacin. We will discuss the importance of these metabolites a bit later in our presentation and the role they play in the progression of heart and heart disease. The several mutations of the SLC6A19 gene causes intestinal and renal malabsorption of neutral amino acids. The normal absorption of amino acid occurs at the luminal plasma membrane of the absorptive cell. The cell has at least four sodium-dependent amino acid transporters one for each kind of amino acid, whether it's acidic, basic, or neutral. The transporters bind amino acids only after binding to the sodium. The fully loaded transporter then undergoes a conformational change and dumps the sodium and amino acids into the cytoplasm, then goes back to its original form. This is totally dependent on the electrochemical gradient of sodium. On the basal lateral side of the membrane, enterocytes also contain transporters that export amino acids from the cell into the bloodstream, and these are not dependent on sodium gradients. My name is Haley Dahl, and I will be presenting the second half of our presentation. As Rebecca just went over how amino acids are absorbed normally, it's important to understand the role that amino acids play within the body to maintain normal functioning. Phenylalanine is an essential amino acid, uh, meaning that it must be supplemented through dietary intake um, as it can't be synthesized endogenously. Good sources of phenylalanine include eggs, beef, chicken, milk, and soybeans. Tyrosine is an example of a non-essential amino acid um, as it's synthesized from the hydroxylation of phenylalanine. This reaction is catalyzed by phenylalanine hydroxylase. Um, if levels of phenylalanine are low, tyrosine is unable to be synthesized and therefore must be supplemented um, just like phenylalanine through dietary intake. Phenylalanine and tyrosine are both aromatic amino acids that are necessary precursors for the synthesis of several important substances and compounds, such as catecholamines and melanin. The complex reaction of hydroxylating phenylalanine to produce tyrosine is irreversible and occurs primarily in the liver, though it can also occur in the kidneys. Catecholamines such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine are synthesized from tyrosine within chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla. Within this pathway, um, which is shown on the left, um, the hydroxylation of phenylalanine to tyrosine is the rate-limiting step and um, therefore controls the rate of the synth 
synthesis of these catecholamines. Tyrosine is hydroxylated to DOPA um, via tyrosine hydroxylase. Rapid decarboxylation of DOPA occurs via L-amino acid decarboxylase to make dopamine. The enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase is responsible for converting dopamine into norepinephrine. Um, norepinephrine can then be converted into epinephrine. Um, similar to its role in catecholamine synthesis, phenylalanine acts as a precursor to the synthesis of melanin. Um, so this just goes to show the import importance of phenylalanine um, and its absorption um, within normal functions of the body. Tryptophan is another essential amino acid. Um, so just like phenylalanine, it must be ingested from dietary intake um, and absorbed. In addition to its role in the biosynthesis of proteins, um, just like all amino acids, you can see looking um, at the pathway shown on the right that tryptophan acts as a precursor for the synthesis of niacin via the kynurene pathway as well as a precursor to the formation of serotonin and melatonin um, all of which I will discuss further on the next slide. Um, serotonin is synthesized from tryptophan via tryptophan hydroxylase and melatonin is synthesized from serotonin um, via N-acetyltransferase. I want to speak a little more about some of the derivatives of amino acid metabolism. Serotonin is synthesized from tryptophan by tryptophan hydroxylase and is a monoamine neurotransmitter. Serotonin is secreted by enterochromaffin cells and has several different functions within the body, such as regulation of mood, appetite, sleep, as well as regulation of intestinal movement. N-acetylserotonin is converted into melatonin through the methylation of the hydroxyl group by hydroxyindole-O-methyltransferase and SAM. Melatonin is a hormone that is produced by the pineal gland and regulates sleep and wakefulness. Niacin or vitamin B3 is an essential nutrient and is a precursor of the coenzyme nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. NAD is important in the catabolism of fat, carbohydrates, protein, and alcohol. Additionally, nicotinamide is necessary for amino acid transporter production in the kidneys and intestine. In total, there have been 23 mutations found for the SLC6A19 gene. This gene encodes for the neutral amino transporter BOAT1, or BOAT1. BOAT1 mediates amino acid transport from lumen into the cells. A mutation causes a single amino acid change in the BOAT1 protein. For example, a specific mutation replaces aspartic acid with asparagine. A defective boat protein leads to an excess amino acid excretion via the urine. Now, some heart and disease affected individuals may not have any mutations at all. As you can see in the diagram on the left, SLC6A19 is present along with the boat 1 amino acid transporter. As I was saying before, the boat 1 is sodium dependent chloride independent and it is also considered a neutral amino acid transporter. So if there's a failure of transporter that means there's going to be improper absorption of any neutral amino acid. Specifically in this situation it's going to be tryptophan. As we have discussed, patients with heart nut disease can't absorb certain amino acids properly. This impedes the body's ability to produce protein and to make vitamin B complex, which can trigger specific mental and physical symptoms. This includes amino acid urea, or high amounts of amino acids in the urine, a skin rash called pellagra, 
which usually results from exposure to sunlight and is distributed on the face, neck, hands, and legs, cerebellar ataxia, failure to thrive, mental retardation, as well as psychiatric symptoms such as depression or psychosis. Even patients who do not possess the genetic mutation may experience temporary episodes of heart disease triggered by malabsorption of amino acids. This can be due to illness, stress, fever, or a nutrient-poor diet. Upon suspicion of heart nip disease, the first test to be ordered will be a urinalysis. This involves collecting a sample to measure the amount of amino acids excreted in the urine. If there are high levels of neutral amino acids in the urine, it may be a sign of heart nip disease. In addition to a urinalysis, a blood test will be ordered to check levels of vitamin B complex, including niacin. Patients with heart nip disease will often have a niacin deficiency due to the inefficient transport and absorption of tryptophan. Plasma levels of amino acids may remain normal. In certain patients, molecular genetic testing may be appropriate to confirm a diagnosis of heart nip disease. Current treatments for heart nip disease include a high protein diet, as this may help to overcome the deficit of neutral amino acids caused by the disease. Patients also respond well to oral therapy with 40 to 300 milligrams per day of nicotinamide or niacin. Oral tryptophan ethyl ester is a lipid soluble form of tryptophan that has been shown to increase serum tryptophan in reverse clinical symptoms in patients with heart nip disease. Patients are recommended to avoid excessive exposure to the sun, taking precautions such as sun protective clothing in addition to wearing sunscreen. Some patients may require mental health treatment such as taking antidepressants or mood stabilizers if mood swings or other mental health problems occur. The prognosis of heart nip disease is good, and frequency of attacks usually decreases with age. The number and severity of attacks can be reduced by maintaining good nutrition and supplementing the diet, as mentioned on the previous slide, with niacin or nicotinamide. Most patients with this disorder can expect to live a normal life with no disability. Rarely, there have been reports of severe nervous system disease and death within families of this disorder, although this is very uncommon. Looking to the future of heart nip disease, further research is necessary in understanding and identifying abnormalities in those patients who present without SLC6A19 gene mutations. Additionally, studying the different SLC6A19 mutations to determine whether they are linked to certain disease factors, such as the presence or absence of symptoms associated with heart nip disease, or even the age of onset of the disorder. Finally, it is important to understand the full extent of systemic neutral amino acid depletion in patients affected with this disorder. I would like to end our presentation on this verse from Psalm, chapter 139, verses 13 and 14. It reads, For it was you who formed my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I think this verse helps to remind us, especially in the study of illness and disease, that God made each and every one of us, specifically and for a purpose. We are not defined by our diseases, but we are defined by God and his purpose for us. Again, my name is Haley Dahl, and on behalf of myself and my partner, Rebecca Feisler, thank you for viewing our presentation. We hope you enjoyed it.